Good morning, church. So glad to see you this morning. Thank you to our praise team for leading us this morning. Uh, we are missing a couple of staff members today. Pastor Chris is, uh, has, uh, was given the offer to come and help lead in a special missions uh, day, lead worship, so he's gone doing that today. And Pastor Drew and uh, his family are, are not doing well this weekend. They're very sick and had the bug hit their household yesterday and today. So um, they have left it to, to Drew and myself and Travis and Miss Tommy and the rest of the staff to have run the ship this morning. Um, but we're placing it in the Lord's hand. Amen. You got the B team this morning, but uh, we're placing it in the Lord's hand today. Um, thank you all for being here. We're going to be in Acts chapter 1. Uh, we, are, we will not be continuing in the uh, message in John today. Pastor Drew will pick up where he left off, uh, hopefully, Lord willing, next week. Um, we pray that uh, they are all well. Continue to pray for them today. Uh, but we're going to uh, pick up in Acts chapter 1 today. I am uh, going to be sharing with you some uh, part of the sermon series that we are leading our students through on Wednesday nights. Uh, our sermon series is titled Compelled, so we're going to go through that today in Acts chapter 1. So students, hang on tight, take some extra notes. You should know um, some of the things I'm about to say. I'm trying to mix it up a little bit. We'll see um, some new stuff for you, um, but maybe you guys can be able to teach this yourself, I hope, right? Uh, Acts chapter 1. Um, so you heard the phrase, um, seeing is believing. Maybe you've heard that, seeing is believing, Right. Um, so I've got a couple of pictures. Just humor me just for a moment. I've got a couple of pictures I want to show you. Uh, those are on the bottom. Mike, I don't know, Michael, if I don't, they're probably at the bottom of the slide. Pop one of those pictures up. There you go. When you look at that picture, um, what do you see? And this is interactive here. You guys can answer this. Somebody tell me what you see. Okay, I saw, I've heard two different things here. I heard a rabbit or a bunny. Raise your hand if you see a rabbit or a bunny. Yeah, okay. Now raise your hand if you see a duck. Yeah, the duck is usually what more people see, I've noticed. Um, so yeah, but it could be a picture of both, depending on your perspective, right? I've got one more picture. Show that next one for us. All right, someone tell me what you see here. Okay, I hear two things here. I hear a donkey. Raise your hand if you see a donkey or a horse, yeah? What about a sea lion? Does anyone see a sea lion? Yeah, a few of you do. I don't know if that's a right brain, left brain thing. I have no idea, right? But it's a different perspective. Same picture, different viewpoint. Um, so as we look through uh, Acts today, we're going to see, uh, this is Luke. Luke is writing Acts to Theophilus, and, and it is, uh, he's writing this, um, the history of the church, what, he shared, what he's seen, um, and it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a part two, maybe, of his gospel, the gospel of Luke, and then you, he picks right back up with Acts um, and kind of shares the history of the church there. Um, but we notice as we look through the gospels, we see the same story with different perspectives, um, and so because of that, I want to share a little bit of Matthew chapter 28. We are going to be in Luke chapter, or I'm sorry, Acts chapter 1 today, but I do want to read uh, from Matthew chapter 28 as well, and this idea of seeing is believing. And while you're turning there, I want to share a story that I shared in first service. It just came to my mind, and I, and I shared this, and um, so many of you... Many of you may know, I don't know, like I don't know if you know this or not, but I, I'm the cook in our house. I love to cook. It's, it's my, the kitchen is my area. My wife doesn't do a lot of cooking, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. Like it's just, you know, so sometimes we have our things and sometimes we don't, right? Um, and cooking is not necessarily her thing and that's okay. She has some dishes that she does very well that I love. Um, but I love, I enjoy cooking. I enjoy cleaning the kitchen. I cook and I clean as I go and, um, you know, so that's just a thing. I just love doing that. Well, I came home, we had um, Andrew led us in some great um, study yesterday um, as we're training our, our leaders and Sunday school leaders, and I came home from that um, midday yesterday, and Amy and the girls had have, have bought a box of cake and some pumpkin stuff, and she, she's, she's going to bake a cake, um, and the girls are going to help her, and so I'm like, this is one of those things we're seeing is believing, right? I didn't believe what I was seeing. But I'm like, okay, she's going to bake this cake, and she told me about this recipe, and I'm like, all right, seeing is believing. And, and if, if you, like, for me, I'm having to, I want to be in it. Like, I want, I want to, like, oh, don't do it that way, like, trying to help them do this and do that way. And seeing is believing, though. So she's, she has this idea of making this cake. I'm like, okay. And she bakes it. I go outside to pack up some things. I think we're doing a college thing that last night, and so I'm packing coolers and different things and, and getting, loading some stuff in my truck. And I come back in a little while later, and, and there is a smell of heaven. Like, it is, it is this awesome smell. I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, I'm almost can, smelling is believing, right? right? So, so, but I haven't seen the cake yet. Um, and they pull it out of the oven, 
And that thing looks fabulous. Like, I don't know, like she has performed a miracle. Um, and, and so we, we started eating this cake, and y'all, it was good. I found myself going back and getting another bite. And I can only take like so many bites at once. And I'm just like, and then I go back and get a, another bite. And it's so good. So much like, okay, we're going to tweak this. And we're going to do some other things with it and make some apple. It's some kind of a dump cake. I don't know, but it was whatever it was, it was good. Um, so if you want that recipe, see Amy, not me. See Amy for that recipe. And she'll, it was so good. Seeing is believing. I saw it. I tasted it. I smelled it. I believed it. So why are you saying all this, John? So in Matthew chapter 28, um, I I opened our sermon series up in Acts with our students with this because I thought it was very important to understand as we are being compelled to share the gospel of Jesus, as we are being challenged to go out to share the gospel to the people around us, I wanted to open with this verse to give a little bit of um, encouragement, I guess you could say. So Matthew chapter 28 Verse 17 specifically, but let's start with 16. Matthew 28, 16 says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Verse 17, And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Some doubted. People who were seeing Jesus, walking with Jesus, saw his miracles, saw the things that he did, saw him die on the cross, Resurrected at this point, still didn't believe. Some people still didn't believe Jesus. So you're like, John, how how is that encouragement? We are called to share the gospel. We are called with uh, the mission of making Jesus known, giving glory to God, making Him known, and making His redemption plan for the world known. And we want to challenge you as pastors and as leaders, we challenge you to be compelled by the gospel to share the gospel, compelled by the Spirit to share the gospel. We want everyone um, to, to have that desire, that longing to share the love of Jesus to all. But we will tell you that not everyone will believe. Even when you share the gospel with them, not everyone will believe. But we want to take pressure off of you. Scripture takes pressure off of us because here's the fact. We are not called to convert people. We're just called to share the gospel to them. We're called to share the name of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the power of the conversion, the work of that conversion is found in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does the work. Jesus already paid the price. The Holy Spirit does the work. We just have to share the word, share the message. It is not up to you or I to make sure that people get saved. It is up to us to share the gospel and Jesus takes care of the rest. Jesus takes care of that and that should Give us a sense of relief to know that when you go to share the gospel to someone, as you're compelled to share it, don't feel the pressure of the world upon you that you've got to change their life. That you've got, you just share how Jesus has changed yours, what He has done for you, the love that Jesus has for them, and the Holy Spirit will take the rest, and He will do the work. We plant the seeds, some will water. God reaps the harvest. Know that and trust in that. Have faith in that. Our goal is to be compelled to go and to share. So Acts chapter 1, we're going to read together Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11 in our reading today. Read that with me. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Verse 9, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from, your, from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Pray with me. Father God, we are so honored and grateful to be here worshiping you together today as a faith family. And we thank you for this opportunity where we can come freely together in this place and worship you, Father. We've, we've, Father, we pray that we worship you with our lives everywhere that we go every day. God, compel us with the Holy Spirit to, to be empowered by your word and the Spirit to share the gospel to those around us. God, to seek out those who are in need of a Savior, who are lost in their sins, and share with them the good news, the message of the gospel. And Lord, as we open your word today, reveal to us in a new way, maybe, or for the first time, reveal to us what your word is saying to us this morning. Use me as a a vessel, though broken and weak and fragile, Lord, I pray that you would use me today to share your word. Holy Spirit, move, open our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear your word, receive it, apply it to our lives, and go and walk out your word. We love you, Father, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we dig into Acts chapter 1, we see, um, starting with verse number 1, four points today we're going to share. The first one is this, that Jesus is alive. Church, we're here to proclaim today that Jesus is alive. Right? In the opening of Acts, Luke writes in his, in his letter here, and he, he's, he's presenting, he says that Jesus presented many proofs that he is alive. He is not a dead God. He is alive. We worship a, a risen Savior. Amen? And, and there's several different um, uh, proofs of this at, that Luke is testifying to, right? We see the empty tomb as a proof. Like, the, the stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. The, the burial clothes were laying there. But if that's not enough, we see other examples that Luke speaks of that he's referencing. We see many appearances of Jesus to the disciples. He, he even appeared to Mary in the garden. And then the disciples a little later, with, um, later on after that. And then he appeared to them several different times on multiple occasions to the disciples sharing with them. But he also, um, Paul records in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he, he uh, appeared before a group of up to like 500 men and he was with them. So there's more people who have seen Jesus, who have seen him resurrecting, is proof that he is alive. We see the, the couple that Luke mentions in his writing, the couple on the road to Emmaus as they have witnessed all of these things and Jesus appears to them. They don't recognize it's him at first and he begins to talk with them and share with them. And then as they sit down for a meal together, all of a sudden their eyes are open to who they are speaking to and it is Jesus. Jesus had revealed himself to them. Many different occasions we see proofs, historical facts that Jesus is alive and well. We do not worship a dead Savior. He is alive and active. Buddha is dead. Muhammad, not alive. And I hate to tell you, church, Nick Saban also will have an end to his... Like he, He's not going to live forever, okay? Hate to break the bad news to you. But Jesus is alive. Amen? And that's who we worship. We worship a risen Savior. Is He alive to you? Is He living within you? Is, is He life for you? He is life for the church. He is alive and well and He is active. He didn't just create us, throw us into this world and back away and said, hands off, I'm leaving it to you. That's not what He did. He is active in our lives. He is a living God. There is no other living God. He is the living God. And because He is the living God, there is power in His name. There is power in the name of Jesus. We see this over and over over through Scripture. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, There is no other name in which we can be saved. No other name can save us. It is by Jesus alone in His death, His burial, His resurrection. It is by Him alone that we are saved. No other name, no other way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 says that, and, and through 11, at, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that He is Lord. And Lord alone. It is Jesus. It is in His name that we worship. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says that whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord. The Lord Jesus. We should work every day as if we are working for the Lord, Scripture says, in everything that we do. We should do it to honor Jesus, to uplift Jesus, and do it in the name of Jesus. It is by no other name that we live or worship but Jesus. It is by Jesus. John 14, verse 14 even says that if you ask in my name, I will do it. 
Now this is not a form of prosperity gospel. It is not Jesus saying uh, that if you ask me to be rich and have all of your wants and desires, that I'm going to give those to you. That's not what He is saying. He's not telling us that we can live in, in huge mansions and drive the nicest cars and, and have a victory at every football game and, and, and all these different things that sometimes we ask and pray for. That's not what He's speaking of. If we ask in His name, He's talking about living out our life for Jesus, even in the midst of struggles and in the midst of trials. God wants to bless us and give us encouragement to walk every day as we face persecutions, as we face sickness and disease, hardships, hard times. He wants us to walk with Him and trust in the name of Jesus. Trust in His power. He wants to bless us to live according to His will, not according to our will. He wants to live according to His way, not according to ours. But God does want to bless us. He, we are His children, His people. So yes, He does want us to be well. But He does not promise us prosperity of any means. But He does promise us eternal life. And He promises us love and forgiveness, freedom from our sins. This is a proclamation of the kingdom of God. We even see that in verse number 3 of Acts chapter, chapter 1. It says that Jesus was alive and, and after His sufferings He had many proofs appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking with them about the kingdom of God. About God's kingdom. Not our kingdom. We shouldn't pray for our kingdom, our wants, our desires to be done, but God's will, God's desires for God's kingdom to come. And we see that even booking and ending uh, this letter of Acts. Luke writes in Acts chapter 28, verse 31, about Paul and about the things that he did, that Paul even to the end was proclaiming the kingdom of God from a prison cell, not having his way, not having his desires, but the desires of Jesus, the desires of the Lord to share the gospel and let God's kingdom come, to proclaim God's kingdom here on earth. That's what we're called to do. Jesus is alive and we serve a risen Savior. Amen? Number two. Next thing we see, verses 4 through 7. Let's read that. And while they're staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait, to wait on the power, to wait on the promise of the Father. So number two, we see that we are to wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. We, we often want to do things our way, right? Uh, it, it, it's, it's a struggle sometimes with our flesh that we want to have our desires and we want to do things. We get so fired up about doing something um, that, that we want to, to rush to that. We get so excited. It could be something good even, and we want to rush to that. But God's Word says to wait on Him. He's telling the, the disciples here, wait on me. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for the promised one to come. It is important that we wait on God. Wait on God before we act. Wait on Him before we act. Patience. Have patience in His promise. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong. And the psalmist repeats, wait. Wait for the Lord. So often it is hard to wait, especially in our struggles. Especially when things are not going how you saw them or how you thought that they would be going. So many times we face hardships and we pray to the Lord, God, act. Please act now. We need you, God. But He's calling us to wait, even in those hardships. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says, Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up like wings of eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not faint. Wait on the Lord. Trust in His strength, in His providence, even in our difficult times. In Lamentations, we see as, as the writer of Lamentations is, is lamenting over the fall of Jerusalem and how Jerusalem is being destroyed and at the end of that, in chapter 3, verse 25, he writes these things, The Lord is good to those who wait on Him. The Lord is good even in our destruction, even in our hardships, even when we are broken, when we are in mourning, sorrowful. The Lord is good, y'all. The Lord is good to us. And so we should wait on Him. Trust in His providence, in His timing, in His understanding. Wait on Him. Remember Abraham and Sarah when God promised Abraham that he, his nation, his people would be multiplied uh, as the number of the stars in the heaven, right? And, and, and he's waiting for this promise that he would have children and see his nation grow and that people would be blessed through Abraham and Abraham would be a blessing to the Father and that his, the nations would be a blessing to God. And he waited and he waited and no children. Years and years and years, Abraham and Sarah waited, 
They waited for the Lord. And the people of Israel waiting hundreds and hundreds of years for the coming Messiah over and over. They went through destruction and they were lifted up and they got close to the Lord and they broke back down in their sin. And over and over again they see this cycle as they're waiting for the promised Messiah. And they waited and they waited. And it took many, many, many years. People wouldn't see in their own lifetimes the Messiah come until Jesus finally came. They had to wait. We had to wait on the Lord. Wait on the promises of the Lord. He is faithful. He is faithful to us in His timing. Wait. The disciples had in mind, as we continue on, and you see as you read through verses 7, uh, 6 and 7, they started asking Jesus, Lord, when will you restore the kingdom of Israel? They too had been waiting for years and years for the kingdom of Israel to be restored to what they thought the Messiah was coming to do. And they had in their mind what the kingdom was supposed to be, what they were expecting to happen. Sometimes God's ways is not our ways. Sometimes our will does not line up with God's will. And what we hope will happen does not happen. But God's ways are better than our ways. And Jesus has the plan. He was the plan. His restoration was a different type of restoration than what the disciples were expecting and what the people were expecting. But it was the best type. It was a restoration and redemption for the world. I want to point out in verse 7, because Jesus confronts that as they ask Him, when is the time, Lord? When, When is the time... We're ready. When is the time? When are you going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know. It's not for you to know. You don't need to know these things right now. That's not what is the priority right now. It's not for you to know the times that the Father has fixed by His own authority. But you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit and He goes to commission them to share the gospel. It isn't the when that matters. Jesus promises us, Scripture promises us that He will return. But it's not the when that matters. So many people will try to tell you, hey, be ready because on November the 22nd of, of 2043, Jesus is returning or whatever. You know, you see, I've seen billboards of people predicting the end of times. It's, it doesn't matter with the when, but what matters is what we do while we wait. What we are doing while we wait. There are people in our city, in your schools, in your workplaces, in our state, in our country, there are people around the world that are dying and going to hell because they do not know the risen Savior. So while we wait, we must share the gospel. We must trust in the Lord in our hardships and we must share the gospel of Jesus to those around us while we wait. It isn't the wind that matters, but what we do while we are waiting. We are to be faithful and honoring to God while we wait. Let's move on. Point number three. We see in verse eight through nine, let's read this together again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, in the end of the earth. So we see this promise in number three, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Point number three, the coming of the Holy Spirit. We see this promise of the Holy Spirit coming in this commission of what we are called to do. And as I shared earlier, the picture on the screen and the different viewpoints that how people see things, we, we see this same viewpoint from Luke and from Matthew. In Matthew chapter 28, we see the Great Commission to go into all nations, right? Uh, Luke chapter 24. Let's actually read this as Luke is the writer of Acts. Let's, let's read Luke 24. We see these same, this same moment um, at, that Luke is recording, that Matthew recorded in 28. We see this here in, in 24. Verse 45, it says, Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and the repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. All nations, beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed from the power on, from on high, which is, is the Holy Spirit. Just another viewpoint of our commission to go and to share throughout the world the gospel, proclaiming the gospel to all nations. Waiting on the Lord, trusting in His time to come, and while we are waiting, sharing the gospel with the power of the Holy Spirit. We see in this scripture in, in, in Acts chapter 8, the sending of the Holy Spirit. It's coming soon. And if you, if you want some homework, go and continue reading chapter 2 and 3 and see how the Holy Spirit starts to work in the lives of the disciples and the lives of people around as thousands of people are saved. We see the work of the Holy Spirit. God sends the Holy Spirit and the disciples are to wait. And the Holy Spirit comes and they, they begin sharing the gospel of Jesus. Verse 8 tells us that it is the power of the Holy Spirit that makes the proclamation of the gospel effective. 
It is not by our strength. It is not by our words. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that should give us a sense of relief, as I said earlier. So many times I hear students say, like, I'm afraid to share because I don't know that I know the right things to say. I don't know that... I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up. or I'm not sure that in the moment I'm going to know what to do. And it should be some relief for us to know that the Spirit is at work. If He is alive in us, if we are followers of Jesus, the Spirit lives within us. He is with us and He will guide us. And if we trust in Him and give our lives to Jesus, trust in His power, we can share the gospel to others. And the Spirit takes over and the Spirit does the work. As we said earlier, it should take relief in that. And I'm sure in this moment, the, the, the disciples had seen so many different things taking place. They had seen Jesus perform so many miracles and seen Him resurrect. And they were excited to get rolling. And sometimes our eagerness, our eagerness to do things for the Lord can cause us to act hastily and to make poor choices. That's why we must trust in Him and the Holy Spirit to do the work. And Jesus tells them, wait, for the power of the Spirit is coming. He is the one that will make the proclamation of the gospel successful. Any attempt to do anything without this, this power of the Spirit in, in, in any other name other than Jesus will fail. Any attempt that we try to do things on our own without the leading and the guiding of the Spirit will not be successful. And it's the Holy Spirit that compels us. We have been talking for weeks and weeks with the students about this word compel. As a matter of fact, there's a huge um, taped version of the word compel on the floor of our student ministry so that they see every day they come in there that we are to be compelled to share the gospel. What does this word compel mean? The definition of compel is to be driven to a particular action by an internal, irresistible urge. As a true believer in Jesus, I feel 100% that if I love Jesus, I trust in Him that the Holy Spirit is inside of me and there is no way to resist His urge to share the gospel. We are driven by the Spirit as believers in Christ to share the gospel of Jesus. It's that internal desire that the Spirit has placed within us to go out and share to Him. And I want us to be, as our students, and we want our church to be so driven by the Spirit that there is nothing else that we can do but share the name of Jesus. Like Peter and, and John, when in Acts chapter 4, uh, around verse 20, they, they've been um, placed into captivity, into custody because they were sharing the name of Jesus. They had uh, just, um, by the power of the Spirit, healed a, a lame person, a beggar, and the people around had seen what had taken place and they took the advantage of that to share the gospel to the people. And it says that 5,000 people were saved. And so they were taken captive and said, look guys, you, you, you're causing a riot and we don't want that. We, we don't want any trouble in our town. Like You've got to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. And they said, how can we not speak about the things that we've, said, that we've seen? How can we not speak about the things that we've heard? How can we not speak about the things that Jesus has done for our lives? That's the same desire that we should have. We should be so compelled that there is nothing else that we can do but share the name of Jesus. And the power of the Spirit compels us to do so. The Holy Spirit gives us the power. He compels us. Let's move on to point number four, our last point. As we pick up, verse 8 continues into verse 9, and it says that when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We see that we are to be witnesses to the world. We're to be witnesses to the world. Jesus describes to the disciples exactly what the Holy Spirit will empower us to do, and it's to be witnesses to the world, to share to the world around us. We are to share the gospel to the ends of the earth. He says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I think it's important. I want to highlight this, this, uh, this place, Samaria, that we see here, I think that it is no coincidence that Samaria was um, a word, uh, uh, the city that was used in his explanation. We know from history that the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. It was it was like mixing oil and water. Uh, they were they were um, two different people. They they um, there's a lot of prejudicism going on. I don't know if I just made a word up. Prejudicism. It's I just made it up. There's a lot of prejudices going on within those two cultures. Um, there was some hatred even, some divisiveness going on. Jews wouldn't speak to Samaritans. They just, uh, there was a lot of division there. And Jesus points out, He uses Samaria as a place that we are to go to share the gospel. So what does that mean for us? What is this mention of Samaria? What could it possibly mean for us? I believe, I believe that Jesus wants us to not just share the gospel to the people that we're comfortable sharing the gospel with, the people that it is easy to share the gospel with. 
I believe he, he doesn't want us to just feel like we can share to the people that we choose to share the gospel to. That the message is for all people. That Jesus gave his life for all. We are to share the gospel with all. The ones that we love and the ones that we may call enemies. To our friends, to those we know, to those we don't know. We are to share the gospel for all. To the outcast, to the rejected, the gospel is for the lonely we are to share to the unpopular, to the popular, whatever. There is no category. We are to share the gospel to all people. Because the gospel is for all people. And for all who believe, they will receive redemption. They will receive freedom from, from sin. Salvation will be theirs. If they repent, turn from their sins, confess their sins, and trust in the Lord, they will be saved. The message is for all people. And I'm so proud to be a part of a church that sees the vision of global missions. That we are on missions in our communities, in our workplaces, that we encourage each other to share the gospel in our schools and on the streets and in our neighborhoods. And that we don't stop there, that we encourage to go out and share the gospel in, in, in our state and in our nation. But then to the ends of the world, to the uttermost parts of the world, I'm encouraged that we know the importance and the emphasis of worldly global missions, both local and abroad. Because that is what we are called to do. And the Holy Spirit will empower us to do so. So where do we start? We start in our Jerusalem, as we just mentioned. You share the gospel in your schools. Week by week, we, we hear stories of our students saying that, hey, I was able to share the gospel with a neighbor next to me. We had one student actually share that she, um, she had this student that would sit next to her, and she made it almost like she, he was trapped where he had to hear what she had to talk about. And she would share the stories of Jesus that we would go over, and she would share the gospel with him. Students are sharing with us about how um, that they have friends who are accepting invites to do one-on-one -on -one Bible studies with, with each other. Students who don't know Scripture, they're starting from the beginning in Genesis and learning about Jesus and about God's redemption plan for the world. That's where, that's where our Jerusalem is, in our schools, in our workplaces, at your jobs, your co-workers. Begin there, that's your Jerusalem, in your neighborhoods, the people across the street. I'm ashamed to tell you that there's a couple of neighbors I know that are believers I've talked to, but there's one across the street that I haven't built the courage to talk to yet, and I can't tell you why. I'm convicted by that. It's not just a few of our neighbors. We need to share the gospel with all of our neighbors. That's what He calls us to do. We start in our Jerusalem, and then we go beyond. And we go out to the world and share the gospel. That's what He calls us to do, but we're not alone. He even tells the disciples in Matthew 28 that you're not alone. I'm with you to the end of the age. I'm always with you, compelling you, giving you the strength to share the gospel. Well, let's wrap up because we, we did read through chapter 11 and there, there's an important aspect of, of chapter, uh, chapter 1, sorry, verses 11, 9 through 11 even, where we see the ascension. And I, I don't know how, like it says that he's riding on a cloud. Like, shoot, I don't know what, what that's like. I mean, I can't even imagine the disciples, you know, the look on their face, the experience that they had when they see Jesus ascending into heaven. I mean, they've already seen him hang on a cross and be be crucified, buried, and then he raised, raised from the dead, like, and, and he performed all these miracles, and then they get to see him, like, riding a SpaceX rocket, to, I don't know what it looks like, I know it wasn't a rocket, right, but Jesus just shoots up, like, and I don't know what it looks like, but it's got to be amazing to be able to experience that, but there's an important reason, there's import, something important that we need to take, and we can dig into this ascension and a lot of different things, but for the sake of time, there's two things that I want to mention, the importance of, of the ascension. We, we have seen, through Scripture, that Jesus defeated death, proving that He was God. Proving that He is God by defeating death, by resurrecting. But the ascension also solidifies that. It proves that not only did He raise from the dead, but He is ruling in heaven. It solidifies His deity. So when we say that we have the power to do all things through Jesus, that we can share the gospel through the power of Jesus, this solidifies that that power is genuine, that that power is real that we can do all things because He is God. It solidifies His deity. And not only does it set up His present rule, but it also sets up His promised return. Because it is shown, even in the Luke verse that we read, that he, that he will return. He will come back just as He left. That Jesus is coming back. Jesus is returning. He is coming back to redeem His people, to take us up, to be with Him. Right? He's going to return. But what are we doing in the meantime? As we wait on the Lord, what are we doing? We're to be compelled to go and share the gospel to those around us through love, through our actions, through our words, through His Word. This is the power 
the Holy Spirit activates the power of His Word in our lives. It is living. It is real. Is it living to you? Is the Holy Spirit active in your life? Just a few questions to ponder as our praise team comes forward as we begin to wrap up. Just a few things to ponder as we wrap up today. First, who, who are you currently discipling? Who are you sharing? Matthew 28 gives us that commission. In the Luke, Luke 24, we, we have this commission to share what we have learned, to make disciples, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who are we currently discipling? Who are you teaching the Word of God to? How is the Holy Spirit working through you to do this? Are you allowing the Spirit to be active in your life? How is He compelling you to go? Or has He been compelling you and you've just been kind of ignoring Him maybe? Let me tell you, if you have the power of the Holy Spirit living within you, it is an irresistible urge. Let Him take over. Let Him guide you and speak through you. Who can you bring to the Gospel this week? Who can you bring to the Gospel, to the redemption plan of Jesus this week? Who can you share the good news of Jesus to this week? Church, it is not up to your pastors to lead your friends to Jesus. It's not up to us to have some grand visitation scheme where we go visit the people that you write down. It's not up to your pastors to do that. It is up to all of us. We are all united together as brothers and sisters of Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit living in each one of us. It doesn't just reside in Pastor Drew, Andrew or myself or Chris or Travis or any of our staff. It doesn't just reside in us. It, it is in all of us as believers. We are all called. Don't bring your... I'm going to have to think about how I say this. Don't bring your friends here just so we can preach the gospel to them. Right? Share the gospel to them where you are, everywhere you go, in your neighborhoods, in your schools, your workplaces. The Spirit gives you the power to do that as well. Share the gospel. Bring someone to the gospel. And then... Invite them to come and join us. Invite them to come and join us in our fellowship and, and, and worship the Lord together. How are you sharing the gospel? What are you doing while we wait for the Lord? And how are you allowing the Spirit to compel you to share the gospel to them? Let's pray together. Father God, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for the blessings that you give us, the encouragement of your word, and to know that we are not alone. You haven't left, left us to our devices. Father, you, have, you walk with us daily. You are here daily to encourage us to lead us, to guide us with the power of the Holy Spirit to share your word. And so, Father, we pray that we do that well. And as we wait for your glorious return, Lord, we pray that every day we are sharing the gospel to those around us, teaching about your redemptive power through the blood that you shed on the cross and the power that is solidified in the resurrection and the ascension. You are God alone. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, either here on this earth or in judgment in heaven, Lord, in judgment before on that great judgment day. We're going to bow before you and confess. So, Lord, why wait? I pray, Father, that if there is someone here today who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, who hasn't called on your name and admitted that they're a sinner and, and, and received that redemptive power, I pray, God, that they would do so today. Today is the day of salvation, Father. Holy Spirit, move them today to give their lives to you. Father, help us and encourage us to share the gospel every day. We love you, Lord. And we pray this in your name. Amen. If you're here today and God is calling you to respond in some way, we want to give you that time to do so as we, as we worship Him together. Let's stand together this morning. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior and you would like to talk with us, the pastors would love to share with you this morning and pray for you. The altar is open. You're welcome to come and, and respond any way that you see fit today. God is here, church. He is alive and active. And He wants to do a move in your life. How will you respond?